Good morning. Welcome back. I am so happy to be here in real life, um, although welcome to online people as well. Uh, and I think I will jump right in to my talk about evolving the mutation spectrum uh, with the hopes that I'll finish in time for lots of questions and discussion, which is, of course, what I, you know, that's the best part for me. So I'd like to hear your feedback on this. Uh, so the mutation spectrum, this is the obligatory slide about mutations coming in many different flavors and colors and at many different scales. Uh, we know that mutation rates are different at single nucleotide scales, that transitions and transversions happen at different frequencies. Uh, there's the infamous CPG transitions that are very common uh, in humans, so nucleotide pairs can matter, and then we can extend that to three mers and five mers and seven mers. So the context in which the nucleotide occurs can change the mutation rate. Uh, and of course, at larger scales, we know that mutation rates differ in coding regions, uh, in genes and gene bodies, and then at even larger scales in possibly megabase pair regions of the genome, there can be differences in mutation rates. Uh, I don't know if there are any other mathematicians here, uh, but mathematically, my colleague, a colleague of mine just explained it to me last week, saying, well, we have a mutation spectrum any time that the mutation rate can't be parameterized by just one letter, mu. So if you have anything more complicated than mu, there's a possibility of a mutation spectrum, and then the possibility of mutational biases. So especially at these larger levels of organization, so at the gene level, uh, we know that spectrum differences, so mutational biases, can be driven by selection. So selection can act to avoid bad mutations. So we have many examples now where we know that the mutation rate is reduced in gene bodies, whoops, in gene bodies or essential genes. And selection can also act to create good mutations. So mutation rate can be increased in places where variability is favorable. So for example, in bacteria, the so-called contingency loci are hypermutable or in our immune system. So there are many uh, examples, beautiful examples. And if you want to hear another one, I think Adi Livnat's talk coming at 12.15 here will give you a further example of uh, ad mutation rate variation that's advant uh, provides an advantage. Sorry, stumbling over my words. So, but at the finer scale of transitions, transversions, GC to AT, these fine scale mutations that might happen across the whole genome, it's a little harder to think about how selection could act on these mutations and could there be general trends. And the work that I'm gonna to talk to you about now, um, Deepa gave a nice introduction to it and the, I'm gonna just sort of expand a little bit on the theory of what we understand or think we understand about this effect right now. So this is work, beautiful experimental work that came out of Deepa's lab and it was largely the work of Myrtle Sane. And if you, uh, this is a little plug, if you'd like to hear more, you can hear a talk, uh, talk about Myrtle's uh, recent work, which was recorded on Tuesday in the experimental evolution session. So because we had these really puzzling experimental results. Uh, and as I always say to my grad students, the sound of scientific progress is not, aha, it's, oh, that's really weird. Like, I don't understand that. Then you know you've got something new, right? So we had something really new to explain here, and this made us think about this analogy. So this is me, um, I'm adapting on a ladder, so, because uh, I would like to be taller. So here I am adapting, and I'm reaching up with my left arm, and the red apples are beneficial mutations, the bad apples are deleterious mutations, and I am a transition-biased organism, so I tend to reach with my left arm when I'm choosing a random mutation, or when a random mutation is choosing me, really. Uh, and as time goes on, as I adapt, you can see I'm sampling from the left side of the tree, and then there might be a benefit for me after I've adapted for a while with my left arm to switching sides. This is what a mathematician calls a uh, really high-tech animation. 
There we go. So there'd be a benefit to reversing the bias with which I've been adapting for some time. Uh, we think this might be a really general effect. It would, doesn't apply to any particular type of bias. Anytime that we can slice mutations, dice them up into different categories, if there is a category that is undersampled that may have beneficial mutations, then switching the bias could be beneficial. So we wanted to investigate uh, this possibility uh, that after, just like I said, after adapting with a particular bias, a reversal may provide a benefit. So we started doing this with adaptive walk simulations. Uh, I'm going to quickly go over this. The idea with an adaptive walk is that you have a random sequence of, in this case, A, C, G, and Ts, and we have a mapping from the sequence to fitness. I've used this very well-studied NK fitness landscape that was mentioned earlier this morning. Um, we, it's a tunably rugged landscape, so you can add as much or little epistasis as you like into this landscape. So you start with a random sequence, you allow it to mutate. If the mutation provides a benefit, that mutation may fix and a step in the adaptive walk is taken. It, it is only taken with probability 2s, for example. And yeah, deleterious mutations can also fix, but with a lower probability. And then you just let the sequence evolve over time. So we ran adaptive walks through these sequences. Uh, for those of you who care, this, an adaptive walk is the strong selection, weak mutation regime of adaptation. So we let mutations happen one by one. Uh, again, we, as I said, we can tune epistasis. So each position in the sequence has epistatic neighbors, and their identity influences the fitness contribution of that site. Uh, and we can tune that to be half a percent to almost half of the sites in the genome are epistatically coupled. We have sequences of length 8 to 200, and now we've taken it up, I think, to 500. Uh, and to give you an idea of how rugged these landscapes can be, when there's lots of epistasis, there are, for example, 7,000 distinct fitness peaks in the landscape. So there are many, many ways that a particular genome can increase its fitness. It can walk up all sorts of different peaks in this highly multidimensional space. Right? So there's a lot of redundancy in the sense that there are many ways to improve fitness. Uh, and through all of these adaptive walks, I'm going to set a transition transversion bias. We've looked at other kinds of mutations, but I'll just, for the purposes of the talk, talk about transition transversion bias. So I'm going to fix the organism's transition transversion bias at the beginning of the walk, and it will always, mutations will always happen with that bias. And then the neat thing we can do is we can, along, as we're moving along these adaptive walks, we can construct the distribution of fitness effects. So to do that, we stop at some point along the walk and freeze the sequence. I'll call it the current wild type sequence. And we can make a single random mutation to that sequence according to our fixed bias. So in this example, the G changes to a C. Uh, we compute the fitness of the mutated sequence compared to the wild type, compute the fitness effect, and do this over and over again. Uh, let me emphasize that when we do it over and over again, we're always mutating the same wild type sequence. So we're starting from mutating another base pair here randomly according to the bias. And we construct the whole distribution of fitness effects. So the distribution of fitness effects would look something like that. This is the origin. Over here, we have all the deleterious mutations. Here are all the beneficial mutations. The area under the curve on this side would be the beneficial fraction of the DFE. And that's going to be important in what we go on to show you. And the neat thing that we can do is we can also, while we've stopped the walk, using that same sequence, we can also construct the, what the DFE would have been if we changed the bias. So we're sampling the same mutations. We have the same sequence. But now we're sampling them with a different mutational bias. So we can move from a transition-biased organism, say, if this transition-biased organism suddenly became a transversion-biased organism, how would it affect the DFE? So we have the current wild-type DFE and a bias-shifted DFE, and I'm going to show you lots of those. So here are just some simple results from the adaptive walk simulations. 
This is over time as the walk progresses. The fitness of the sequence increases as expected. And also, no surprise, the fraction, the beneficial fraction of the DFE decreases over time as the walk progresses. The sequence gets more fit. Fewer and fewer of the one mutant neighbors are still beneficial. And how does that look in the DFE? If we imagine here, this is the distribution of fitness effects early in the walk when something like 34% of all mutations are beneficial. As time progresses, this DFE will shift left, right? Fewer and fewer beneficial mutations. But what if we shift the bias? So when we stop the walk early and make a change, have our organism choose mutations with the right hand, there's really not a lot of difference in the DFEs. But later on, you can see, although our focal organism, the wild type, has been depleting the red apples on the left side of the tree, so the DFE is shifting to the left, if we change the bias, the DFE may not change very much, and so there's a much bigger beneficial fraction uh, later in the walk if you're able to shift the bias. So there's a lot on this slide. I'll try to talk you through it. Um, how big is this effect in reality? So I've got the percent change in the beneficial fraction on the y-axis. So this would be the percent change between the area under the curve in blue and the area under the curve in red. And then I'm stopping the walk at different points. So if we look first at the end of the walk, here we have something like only 4% of all mutations are beneficial for the wild type. That result corresponds to this top line in coral, 4%. This is the fraction of beneficial mutations in the wild type. And this axis is the bias that we've shifted to. So the wild type bias is here. And you can see if we make a big shift away from the wild type bias, reverse the wild type bias late in the game, there's a very substantial increase in the beneficial fraction, the DFE. That decreases for smaller and smaller shifts. Of course, if you make no shift at all, there's no change in the DFE. And if you reinforce the wild type bias, you know, reach even further left than the wild type, then you have even fewer beneficial mutations available. Uh, but although this trend is really strong, late in the walk, very early in the walk, we can already see this trend happening, even after a few mutations have been sampled. So, you know, if you, um, if you do modeling or if you complain about modelers, you'll know that there are always these caveats. So you find some really neat effect, but it's only really valid in this particular regime of parameter space when this is greater than that and this is less than that. Uh, this result has actually turned out to be one of the most robust phenomenon that I have had the privilege of investigating in my career. Like, I just, I can't break it. So we tried this across many different sequence lengths, many different degrees of ruggedness in the landscape. We've tried it for transition transversion and GC to AT and also particular individual base pair mutations. It holds for wild type sequences, as I said, at the end of the walk that are well adapted, but also holds even when the wild type is, really has a lot of room, a lot of evolutionary potential, still has only started an adaptive walk. And we've also extended this now, not to just adaptive walks, but to full populations. So we have full populations simulated in the clonal interference or multiple mutation regime. So these populations are maybe five or 10,000 individuals with 10 to 15 uh, different genotypes, all evolving at once, segregating in the population. This phenomenon still holds. Uh, and we've also extended it to a codon-based fitness landscape. So all the results that I showed you were for a fitness landscape in which the nucleotide sequence determines the fitness, but we could also build a landscape such that the codon, you know, the amino acid identity determines the fitness, and then we can have completely synonymous and neutral mutations. Uh, this pattern still holds. 
So this begs the question, I, I've shown you that there might be some selective advantage to reversing the bias. So what would happen if we let the bias itself evolve? And I have a student, Marwa Tafaha, and she's working on this right now. She's got full-scale populations with, in which the mutation rate, the mutation bias, and the sequence can evolve. And she's pushing those results through. But I'm going to show you just some like preliminary but interesting results, uh, which are a little cleaner. So what we do to get these is we have to start with, we want to start with a realistic genome. So we start with a fit wild type, which is a wild type somewhere towards the end of the walk with something like a beneficial fraction of 5%. Uh, so this is uh, a wild type that we might imagine you would see in nature, a well-adapted organism. And starting with this fit wild type, we continue the adaptive walk, but now we allow the bias to evolve. So mutations change the sequence, but they also sometimes change the bias. And we change the bias in two different ways. We've done what I call the quantitative genetics approach. So there, we just let the bias change in, by small amounts. So we have a little Gaussian distribution centered on the current bias, and the bias can only change a little bit from what it is before in the wild type or in the ancestor. And then we have what I think is probably the more realistic knockout approach, because if you imagine gaining or losing a DNA repair enzyme, uh, in bacteria, we know that this can make an enormous change to the bias, transition transversion bias, for example. And so for this case, we just pick, whenever the bias mutates, we just pick a new bias uniformly on the interval 0, 1. So here are some results. These are by Kishore Basu who, from my group, who's now moving on to Toronto in the fall. Uh, Kishore adapted... So I've got these well-adapted wild types to start. So if the wild type started and had been adapting with the transition bias of 0 0.9, then at this time 0, this is when we allow the transition bias to start evolving itself. And you can see it starts to move down. The bias starts to reverse. If, in contrast, the wild type was adapting for a long time before this at 0 0.1, then when we allow the transition bias to evolve, it starts to reverse the bias, come up. Uh, just to clarify what our expectation would be, if there's no selection at all, we would expect in this case, for instance, that the bias should stay centered at 0 0.7, but the variance should grow over time. But the line, this is the average of uh, 100 or 200 simulations. So we'd expect the average would stay at 0 0.7 and the variance would grow over time, but we, we wouldn't expect a trend. And we see these really lovely trends so we see the bias reversing over time. And likewise, when we allow the bias to evolve in large jumps, now here again, let me give you your expectation. We evolve for a certain time, for example, in this case at 0 0.9, then we allow the bias to change. We're picking a new bias whenever it changes uniformly on 0, 1. So in the average of 250 simulations, after averaging them, we would expect the bias should move maybe gradually because it won't change right away potentially, but whenever it does change, it, on average, it'll get to 0 0.5. So we expect it might, I expected it would drop gradually to 0 0.5 and stay there. And this is instead what we see. As soon as we allow it to change, it jumps. It jumps well past 0 0.5. So the, there's a strong effect here of the bias reversing and then gradually comes back to 0 0.5. And likewise, if we started with a bias of 0 0.1, so we created this fit mutant by an adaptive, through an adaptive walk with a bias of 0 0.1, the jump is above 0 0.5 and then back down. So the jumps are statistically larger than expected and we see bias reversals more often than expected by chance. So why does this happen? Uh, changing the bias, we think, allows access to previously undersampled beneficial mutations. And I've just got a few um, full results from full population simulations to show you. These are just examples. I apologize that this, this is really hot off the press. These are examples that we got like this week. But you can see here, this is the beneficial fraction versus time. So we adapt for a long time with the fixed bias. 
And then at this time point, we suddenly let the bias evolve. Uh, and you can see that the beneficial fraction, this is a close-up of this little twig. Uh, the beneficial fraction jumps up and in this case continues on its merry way. The organism or the sequence, I guess, in, no, this is the population. The population maybe has moved to some different adaptive space and is now continuing to evolve. And likewise, uh, there's a slightly different example I wanted to show you. Same thing, you can see in the detail here, there's sort of a transient increase in the beneficial fraction as soon as we let the bias evolve, and then it goes back down. So this is all consistent with our hypothesis uh, that after adapting for some time, even for actually short times, although I've shown very long times here, uh, even short times adapting with a certain bias, reversing it might be beneficial. So what about changes to mutation rate? Of course, uh, of course, that's, a, again, the very natural question that Deepa mentioned, in fact, promised that I would tell you about, and I'm not going to tell you too much about it. Uh, but uh, to my surprise, some these mutator strains that we know a lot about in E. coli, for example, when we knock out a DNA repair enzyme, we typically think of it as increasing the mutation rate. But many of them uh, increase the mutation rate and also change the bias quite a bit. And some of them, to my surprise, uh, change the bias, but hardly change the mutation rate at all. So there are examples of knockout DNA repair enzyme strains in which the mutation rate changes a tiny bit, but the bias changes hugely. So that's interesting. But of course, we want to know what would happen when these changes are coupled. Uh, one thing I'll point out, it's, you know, well, we, it's well known that increasing the mutation rate will increase both the numbers of deleterious and beneficial mutations. But this idea of reversing the mutation bias, this offers the organism a way to increase the fraction of beneficial mutations without changing the deleterious, without increasing the number of deleterious mutations. So I think it might be a really powerful effect. And we're working right now uh, on simulations for realistic mutators using E. coli as a model, looking at specific DNA repair enzyme knockout strains and how they change the mutation rate and the bias and doing them in competition with each other. So my bottom line is that bias reversals, I think, should be common in evolutionary trajectories uh, for these, I think, sort of self-evident reasons once you've thought about it, that it would be good after adapting with one bias to switch over to the other team for a while. I'll refer you to uh, the bioarchive paper, Shifts in Mutation Spectra Enhance Access to Beneficial Mutations. So this is the one that Deepa mentioned as well. And I'll thank Deepa, Myrtle, and Kishore, who have been absolutely wonderful to work with. Uh, and shout out to Gustav Klimt as well for his beautiful painting of a tree and fruit. And that's it. Thank you. Yeah, Rob. Yeah, absolutely. So the colors, the question is um, with extreme uh, epistasis, the colors of the apples can change every time you pick one. And that is included in our model. So in the, especially in the extreme case where we have 43% of the other sites, so each site is coupled to 43% of the other sites in the genome. So if anything in those other 43% changes, the fitness effect of this site, the color of this apple could change. We still see the effect. Yeah. Yeah, so if, if I understand correctly, the question is, so first-order selection will be stronger than second-order selection, and this will be a second-order 
selective effect, so it may be hard to see or hard for it to fix. Yeah, I think that's true, but I think it would f may fix in the same way that hitchhiking uh, of mutators fix. So it's this second order change that would allow uh, access to a beneficial mutation that would give a very strong first order change and then carry this mutation along with it. Of course, my intuitions are um, admittedly formed for asexual organisms. So if you have some recombination and can lose that linkage, then maybe you would just have this transient change in bias and the beneficial mutation would go on its merry way and the bias could just go back to its old self. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. The question is, with transitions and transversions, uh, with transitions in particular, once you've made the transition, you know that the reverse transition is then going to be deleterious. So you've depleted that transition. With, of course, it's more complicated with transversions because you can make transitions through two transversions. Uh, and we've also looked at GC to AT, but the same would be true in that case. Uh, so if we change a G or a C to an A or a T, then we know that the reverse is deleterious, and so we have definitely depleted that beneficial mutation. So, yeah, I don't know if it's particular to that. We are looking, I have another graduate student who's developing a sorry, very formal mathematical look at this, in particular with the transitions and the transversions and the way that they interact. Uh, and then we'll extend it to more general classes of mutations. But I haven't thought of the case where, like, can you give me an example of what you would look at that wouldn't have that effect? Yeah, possibly. So that the answer was triplets, maybe. Like if I think of amino acids, if we change this amino acid to that amino acid, then we know that changing back will be a deleterious effect unless something else changes and we have epistasis. So in general, if you make one mutation of a certain type, changing it back will always be deleterious and you've lost, you know, if you depleted that potential. But I, it's a good question. I have to think about it. Yeah, Arlen. I guess we'll talk after. <laughs>